good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to our second webinar of uh, the project Feminists in the Climate Movement uh, on behalf of the Green European Foundation in partnership with the uh, Polish Foundation Strefa Zieleni uh, and uh, another Green Foundation from uh, Finland, uh, Green Economics Institute and the Green Foundation from Belgium. Uh, so, um, uh, I am uh, today, uh, last webinar, the first webinar, Polish webinar, was about just transition. Uh, we were in a very good company and uh, give you the link uh, to the first webinar during uh, our uh, session today. And uh, today, uh, after this just transition, we will speak about money and women. And uh, why? Because without money, uh, women cannot do anything. Money is really something that is necessary for uh, actions to give uh, uh, and to guarantee real equality. Uh, uh, the funds are absolutely necessary. And uh, this is uh, something that uh, is a big problem. So today we will speak about the European Recovery Fund and the European Green Deal and the Polish Recovery Fund and uh, uh, what is the situation, how it is benefiting uh, uh, to women. Uh, so uh, I will ask um, our coordinator, one of our two coordinators of the project, the other one is Aleksandra Kowajek, who was moderating the first webinar, now Magdalena Gałkiewicz, uh, she is the uh, secretary of the Polish Green Party, and I didn't present myself, I'm Ewa Sofin Jakmar. I am um, uh, president uh, of the board of the Polish uh, Green Foundation Strefa Zieleni, and I am member of the board of the Green European Foundation. So Magdalena Gałkiewicz, uh, our coordinator, I give you the floor and uh, asking you to uh, present our speakers. Thank you, Eva. Hello, everyone. So uh, I really uh, warm welcome to uh, our guests. It's really uh, a great array of the experts to today. Uh, firstly, I welcome Alexandra Gies, uh, which is a member of the European, European Parliament from Germany, uh, initiator of the Gender Impact Assessment Next Generation EU report, and uh, initiator also as well of the Half of It campaign. Uh, our second panelist is uh, Dr. Eva Ruminska Zimne, a feminist economist from the SGH Warsaw School of Economics associated with the Congress of Women and uh, an expert on gender budgeting. And finally, Ursula Zielinska, our Green member of the Polish Parliament who fights for women's rights within the Parliament and with, uh, with protesters on the streets. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, girls, uh, to being here, for being here. And I'm sure that we will have an insightful discussion today. Well, so uh, as Eva said, our topic is the European Green Deal and EU Recovery Fund and gender perspective on that. Uh, and here my first uh, question to Alexandra Gies, because uh, you are an initiator on this report, uh, Gender Impact Assessment, and uh, could you please uh, give gives us uh, a visibility what this report was initialized for and uh, what are the results of this report. And then also I would like to ask you about this campaign, half of it, uh, what it was about and what the results are. The floor is yours, Alexandra. Thank you very much, Magdalena. Thank you very much, Eva, for those friendly words of introduction. Um, could I, and, and good evening to, to everybody listening, could, could I have my presentation on the screen? Yes, I think uh, I need to give you a, a roll, or it's all already done. Uh, it is um, done, you can yeah, share the screen. Done. Yeah, so you should uh, put uh, share the screen. You have a button uh, on the bottom of the page, you have share screen button. Okay. 
Here we go. Yeah. Okay. Great. Right. Okay. Perfect. Yes. So thank you all very much for this this opportunity to present Next Generation EU, um, the half of it campaign, and especially the gender impact assessment we did on Next Generation EU at a very early stage. So it's not a final gender impact assessment on what Next Generation EU became became in the end, but it was something we did in the very beginning. What you see here is uh, the day we launched the campaign that was in May 2020 and that's me and then the president of the gender mainstreaming network of um, the European Parliament together it was in full COVID so we had to keep the distance and we couldn't you know we would have wanted to be a lot of women holding that but we could only be two for COVID reasons and lockdown reasons so this is how how it all started. Um, why did it start? Okay why did I demand half of it? Um, it was quite clear that in, already in April 2020 that COVID was not only a global health crisis, but it was also giving rise to a huge economic crisis, probably the worst recession the Western world has seen since World War II. And what was interesting from a gender point of view, that it was hitting women particularly hard for a series of reasons. Um, one was very obvious. I don't know how the situation evolved in Poland, but in many European countries, including mine, Germany and Italy, the other country that I know very well in Europe because I used to live there. Um, the first thing to close were schools and childcare institutions. And when you close to schools and childcare institutions, children just don't, don't just go away. I mean, they still require being attended to, being taught, um, being cared for. And this is done in families and families very often still means mothers. So many mothers had to work from home at the same time while they were taking care of their children, which whoever has or has, has ever tried to do that knows it doesn't work. <laughs> so you first take care of your children and then at night you work rather than sleeping, which put a huge pressure on women. And many women had to reduce the working hours or drop out of the labor market altogether because it was impossible to handle. And the second reason why this was particularly hard on women is because COVID hit um, those sectors where people work with people, so-called client-facing sectors. And this is usually where women work. And you see a list of the sectors here um, let me see if I can go to presentation mode. Um, just give me a second. Uh, did it before? Uh, here, full screen. Okay, great. This is it. Um, so those sectors that were particularly hit, you see them on the slide, were education, healthcare and social, which is surprising because we would think that those people had to do more work, but there's a lot of private healthcare, a lot of private social services that had faced a big crisis, food and accommodation, so hotels and restaurants and so on, arts and culture, all the artists and domestic services. And you see that um, in most sectors, um, there was a very, very high share of women. Retail is another one as well. So you see um, the purple part are women and the blue part are, are men. And you see that those sectors where women worked were particularly hit. Then as Greens, we fought very hard, especially as German Greens, in order to have next generation EU, therefore a help package um, that would be for the, the European economy that would be funded and guaranteed for by all countries, including countries with a strong economy uh, as Germany. But then when the EU Recovery Fund or Next Generation EU came, um, I was quite disappointed because there is a strong focus on the green transition, which from a green point of view, obviously is very good. 37% of the money goes to the green transition and 20% goes to the digital transition. Um, which is also important and I do digital politics, I know how important this is. But those are sectors where very, very few women work. And if you look, have a look at the sectors that benefit, it's basically construction, then agriculture is a little bit apart, it's listed here, but it's not really in, in next generation EU now. Construction, energy, 
renewable energies and transport. This is basically the green transition. Those are the three sectors concerned. And those are industrial sectors where the share of women being employed is below 20%. And then the fourth one is ICT, Information and Communication Technology for the digital transition. Um, the Europe-wide share of women working in that area is 17%. So what I noticed in May was we have a crisis that is hitting women for a series of reasons. And we have a recovery package to support the economy. And that means to support the people that is um, earmarked to male dominated sectors. So women are losing jobs or have to drop out of the labor market and do more unpaid work. And the money is going to the man. And I think this, this is not possible. I mean, it's so obvious in this crisis that this is not right, that I need to do things, something about it. And therefore we asked, you know, this was, this was basically an intuition in May and I couldn't prove it in any way. It was just, just a feeling I had from talking to trade associations and concerned women. And then looking at the first proposal of the commission that didn't even mention women, basically it didn't mention a gender perspective at all. And therefore we asked two economists to do a gender impact assessment on this first proposal of the commission which is what they did. And they found out that actually next generation EU as it was proposed by the European Commission was completely gender blind and didn't absolutely take into account the gender perspective. And it confirmed everything I, I explained before. Um, okay, how does this go forward? Sorry. Okay, here we go. So the study was conducted um, by Dr. Elisabeth Klatzer from Austria and Azura Rinaldi, Dr. Azura Rinaldi from Italy. And it concluded, as I said, that most of the money would be invested into male dominated sectors and that the proposals were not living up to the EU legal obligations, nor to the political commitments of the European Commission. And therefore it recommended that in addition to the focus on the digital and the green transformation, we needed a further emphasis on investment in paid care work. Um, the care transition was, was another goal we had. Um, therefore, what did we demand in the parliament's position? First of all, the inclusion of gender equality as a binding principle into the guidelines for the recovery and resilience facility, um, which is the, the, uh, the recovery and resilience facility is the core of next generation EU with 607, 670 um, billion euros. Then we asked for gender mainstreaming to be a horizontal principle. And very specifically, we asked for gender impact assessments to be done on the national plans. You know, this facility works in a way that the European Commission basically um, makes the money available, but the, thing, the countries, the member states, have to set out a national plan and how they intend to spend that money. And that plan has to comply with the requirements set out in the regulation. So this is what we're talking about. So what we asked for, and at a certain point, we had a broad majority in parliament where these gender impact assessments for the national plans, where for each national plan, um, experts would have had to look at every single measure and decide whether that's gender equal or not. And if it's not, what can be done about it? And that would have been, I think, really the silver bullet to make sure that men and women benefit equally and to make sure that these funds are well spent. Because if you don't do that analysis, you don't achieve growth, even less sustainable growth, and you don't really help the recovery of the, of the economy. Um, so that was our main point. Then we asked for sex disaggregated data, which is very important because if we are saying the money is not going to the women, um, we have to give some evidence. And as long as you don't have that evidence and you don't, as long as you don't have that numbers, it's very difficult to prove. And there's always someone saying, oh, it's not true. And women are married anyway. So I think we really need that, that data and that analysis. Um, that's the basic basis really for, for gender budgeting. Um, okay, then there are a few more things that I will skip for sake of time, but I can share the presentation later if, you, if you're interested in seeing the details. So um, what did we get, actually? We had a very, very strong position of the European Parliament. But as you know, the Parliament doesn't decide on its own, but it has to come to an agreement with the European Council. And the Council, where the member states' governments are represented, 
was dead set against any kind of gender perspective, even less gender impact assessments, gender budgeting, and so on. So we had a very difficult trilogue, which is that process in which um, the European Parliament and the European Council tried to find an agreement in order to come up with a regulation. And obviously we had time pressure because especially the southern countries in, in Europe um, really desperately need this money. Um, so we had to be quick. And there were other things to negotiate. And as it often happens, um, the interests of women were not really supported the way they should have been supported. And we lost the really strong point of the parliament, which were the gender impact assessments. Um, we came back then to, um, there, there is a guiding principle anyway, in terms of gender main, mainstreaming, um, but it's, it's not really binding and we don't have clear objectives and targets and this is the problem we have today. Um, I came after that happened, I went back to talking to the commission, the task force recover, which is really the task force working directly for commission president, for the commission president on, on this topic. And they were quite open for it. It's led by a, by a woman and they were quite open and they agreed to, um, to taking up some of our recommendations in the guidelines. Well, they, they sort of listened to our recommendations and saw the data and the evidence we provided that it's useful. And then they came up with guidelines that the, that the national governments had to abide by while setting out the plans. And these guidelines say um, that the member states need to describe how the measures will contribute to gender equality and the mainstreaming of these objectives. And they shall outline the most important national challenges in terms of gender equality, equality of treatment, opportunities between men and women. They need to explain what, um, the, what happened during COVID crisis to women and how the national plans um, foster gender equality, which is at least a requirement which forces member states to deal with the topic so I'm not particularly satisfied with many of the answers that national governments are giving, but at least um, the topic has been brought up and they have to work on it, they have to think about it. And there are some very interesting um, plans like the Spanish plan, for example, some interesting things in the Finnish plan. So, I mean, there, there are some positive examples. I'm not, not satisfied on average, but there are some, some interesting things in the plan. Um, so, this is where I think we did achieve something because at least the topic was talked about, especially in Italy, there was a really, really huge public campaign because a lot of journalists picked up the half of it campaign and talked about it. Um, so there was a growing awareness on how important economic independence is and how important um, women's jobs are for growth overall in a country for social cohesion um, and, and for, for social justice. Where we did achieve something extremely important on the other hand uh, was in the multi-annual financial framework, which is the seven year budget um, for the European Union that runs, starts, the next one starts the 1st of January, 2021, I started actually, um, and runs until 2027. And there's a thing called the interinstitutional agreement on the multi-annual framework. And there we have a provision on gender budgeting and gender equality that is really, really good. And for the first time, it's something very, very concrete where we can measure the progress the commission are making. So it basically says two very important things. First of all, um, the assessment of gender impact needs to be strengthened in impact assessments and evaluations under the better lawmaking framework. So this is sort of Eurospeak. What it means is that the European Commission, every time it comes up with a legislative proposal, it has to do an impact assessment, which usually has three dimensions, the economic dimension, the social dimension, the ecological dimension, and it considers um, small and medium and the, the impact on small and medium enterprises. And so here for the first time, we need, they need to consider the gender impact as well. Um, the new guidelines the commission has come up with are not satisfying yet, but at least we have a legal basis really to work on this. And I think we, the commission will, will be able to do better. Um, what is really going well is the second requirement the commission has to develop a methodology to measure the relevant expenditure at program level. 
which means the money that is actually being spent in the multi-annual framework and has to use this methodology as soon as that is available and no later than January 1st, 2023, it will implement that methodology for certain centrally managed programs to test its feasibility. So what does it mean? It has to find a methodology to track where the money goes, to which beneficiary it goes according to a gender perspective. So ideally we end up with uh, a budget that clearly says, okay, these funds from agriculture, 20% go to women, 80% go to men. I mean, we prefer it to be 50-50, but I think that's not the reality. So if this works, we will have very, very clear numbers where this money is going and who is benefiting from it. And that will be really the political basis, having the facts to say, okay, how can this be gender mainstreaming? How can this be equality among citizens, between citizens, if 80% of the money is going to 50% of the population. We don't know what the numbers will be, but we can all imagine. So this is really, really important to have this tracking methodology. So um, at midterm, which is in the middle of the seven years, starting from 2021, so it's going to be 24, 25, um, it will be explored whether that methodology can be extended to other programs for the remainder of the multi-annual financial framework. And the other programs means like the structural funds, agricultural funds, research, and so on. And that's extremely important because this means it's going to arrive in the member states. And the member states will have to come up with sex, with, with gender disaggregated data, and they will have to implement this. And I think this is going to be a huge debate. So I know it's it's a long time frame, 2024, 25 sounds very long, but considering how much time we've been speaking about gender budgeting and not been doing anything, I think this is really huge, huge progress. And this is something where we can work on. I've tried to start working on this in my, in my member state, which is Germany and in my region, basically, to try to come up with something similar, to, to raise awareness, to tell people, okay, this is coming anyway, whether you like it or not, but it's coming. And I know from my direct contact that the commission, um, the director general for budget is, is really keen on doing this because when they started really studying the topic and looking at all the material, they realized this is really key in order to have a sustainable and successful economy that allows for social cohesion. This is not only good for women, this is good for everybody. So I think this is this is really, really important and we should keep working on it. One more element, um, there's a special report of the European Court of Auditors, which is an, the auditing body of the European Union. And these reports are held in very high esteem by the European institutions. And they're very interesting. And this one particular, it's also easy to read. So I really recommend it to everybody. Um, on gender mainstreaming in the EU budget. Um, so um, it, it formulates a series of recommendations, clearly strengthening the institutional framework for supporting gender mainstreaming, which means having better legislation, incorporating the gender perspective in the legislation. It asks the commission to carry out gender analysis of needs and impacts, um, update its better regulation guidelines, which is it has been doing, which uh, it's been done. It's not satisfying, but there are further documents down the line. And we will insist on these documents being better than the first one. And then especially systematically collect, analyze and report existing sex disaggregated data for the EU funding program. Programs. And that will mean that like, for agricultural or structural funds, where a lot of money goes to Poland, for example, you will really have an instrument to ask for gender disaggregated data, and you will be able to prove where this money goes. And this makes it a lot easier to have a strong political message saying, okay, this is not just, this is not right, and we need to fight for more equality. So other, um, another recommendation on, on gender-related objectives and indicators, which is something the commission is progressively incorporating in its budget. And obviously, as we said at the beginning on the recovery and resilience plans, it says also we need to assess and report whether those gender equality objectives are being met. And we keep working on this. Um, 
you know, in the first round, as I said before, it looks as if the national plans are not addressing this adequately, but we are insisting on monitoring this correctly and we will definitely come back to it. Okay, so this would be my round of introduction and um, first introduction to the topic. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alexandra. It's really mm -hmm. interesting insight on the situation in the European Union. And I really think it's very important to have this data uh, on Euro European and national level and indisputable condition to go forward on this topic. And right now, uh, I would like to ask Eva Rumiska Zimny, because you are an expert on gender budgeting. Uh, could you please tell us uh, what is exactly the gender budgeting? What, the, what is uh, the idea? What is about? Uh, what is the history maybe on, in the uh, European uh, Union? Uh, what are the competences of European Union on this matter? And is this any practice on the Union, European Union, or maybe in Poland? Eva, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for this introduction. And uh, maybe I will start with a short comment to what Alexandra has said. And I would like to congratulate on the steps, uh, further steps uh, in this battle to put gender issues really in in the agenda of ministers of finance and economy, you know, ministers who actually uh, are responsible for the budgets and for where the money goes. I remember very well the discussion which we had in the European Parliament. I was at the hearings, uh, a very small agenda item on the hearings for the budget which just ended in 2020. And these hearings were done, as I recall, in 2012. And it was around the report which was called Investing in Europe's Future. And this was about making Europe competitive, sustainable, and whatever. And then, um, you know, the whole report has only one or two tables which were gender disaggregated as far as data are concerned. And they had a lot of discussion of how to make Europe competitive, how to improve the labor market, you know, how to make uh, Europe being a high tech uh, hub. But in fact, uh, gender issues and equality issues were only in a small section, which was at the end of the report. And it was clearly said that in all European projects in which were investigated in the past uh, from the perspective of how the money are spent in these projects, you know, the preambles of the projects has very nice words about core value, gender equality as a core value. But if they look at how actions were defined and how funds are allocated for this, purpose and also how indicators of problems were allocated, then you didn't see anything there. You know, there was, for example, the goal was to improve the share of, uh, uh, they increase the employment rate, but there was not said about women and men. It was just about the general improvement in employment rates. So uh, in fact, it was useless in terms of doing something. So what you presented now, it's reassuring because it's a next step forward. This is a discussion about how the money are spent. And I believe it, it's, it's truly essential. Without that, I believe we will not achieve any progress in gender equality. This will remain on paper. And in fact, uh, Poland is a EU member since 2004 and has all this wonderful legislation adopted and nothing happens. For example, the wage gap, we still have 20% of the wage gap uh, between women and men, even if it's in fact forbidden in Polish law, in the EU regulations and the other directive, etc. So I think gender budget is, uh, is a great tool to achieve it. The problem is, uh, of course, that you need so-called political will to do it, to start with. I will talk about that later on, maybe I would just to say a few words, what it is gender budgeting and what are the experiences. And then I will move a little bit what is needed to actually do it. Uh, well, it's rather simple because gender budgets, uh, the first gender budgets were uh, done uh, by Australia in 1964, quite a long time ago. Um, it was very um, up to the uh, fashionable topic among the feminist economics research in 1990s, 1980s, 1990s later on also. Elizabeth Klasser was, uh, was uh, one of the women 
and, and establish a network of gender budgeting economists in Europe. So she's very, you know, you refer to, to her work and I think it's, it's, it's fantastic what she has achieved. But um, many countries started to use it. Over 60, 70 countries now worldwide are using gender budgeting at different levels. You know, uh, starting from uh, Austria to Scandinavian countries like Sweden, but also UK has some recommendations on the UK budgets done by independent gender budgeting group. But also you do it at municipality level. Uh, Berlin, the city of Berlin is doing, the city of Stockholm, uh, you can do it also, San Francisco, you can also do it at the local community level. So you can do it at any level. Uh, and it doesn't mean that you will have a budget which is 50% for men, 50% of women. You will not also have uh, uh, a specific uh, 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 special budget for that. What you need, you need to answer to the key question and make a evaluation of the existing budget of a city, municipality, local authority, or uh, the country, to what extent it promotes gender equality or not. Because in the budget, you have all, always compromises and money is never enough. So you have to decide if you, for example, or build a parking lot or football stadium, or you will have investments in, in a playground for kids or kindergartens. So you have to have the voices of men and women heard in the process of preparing a budget, any budget, national budget, but also the local community budget. Well, these voices of women are not heard. Women are not a decision-making position in the finance sector, but also in parliamentary committees on the budget mostly. So their voices are not heard and the, the um, requirements for the budget are really built according to the men's needs. You make a very wonderful uh, uh, um, uh, slide showing you know, where the money goes and what sectors are affected in pandemic. And this is very clear, it has always been like that. Male dominated sectors were receiving funds, first of all, later on, this was where women, uh, the sectors when women was employed. This was in 2008, uh, 2009 crisis. This was very clear picture. So what we need, in fact, do we need to equalize through the gender budgeting process, the bias, the gender bias in economics and the way the economics rules and reg 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 regulations were done for the labor market, for the finance sector, and so on. You know, the difference between the position of the men and women is because women are responsible for the unpaid work. And this unpaid work is not visible in the, G uh, uh, in the GDP calculations, similar as the green, the expenditure for the pollution and other cost uh, side effects of the um, industrial development. It's the same, unpaid work is not reflected in the, in the GDP. In, uh, in general, in European countries, it's uh, over uh, one third of the GDP, it's a lot. In Poland, it's between 40 and 50% of the average wage. So this is a contribution which is completely invisible on the side of GDP, but it's also invisible on the side of how GDP is spent. What are the priorities and priority expenditure? So the gender budgeting is in fact showing the possibilities how to do it. Uh, is it easy or not to do it? No, it's not easy. It's not easy to do it because as I say, uh, what we, you need to do it first to have a political will. At the level of the national uh, government, and certainly, if I may say uh, about Poland, this will is not there. This will is still focused around a very traditional view, what should be a woman's role in a society and the economy, and what should be the male role. Men are uh, considered to be the major bread, uh, breadwinners, and women are primarily mothers. So all the system, which is in our plans for the future recovery is around that. It, to make women going back home to different sort of transfers and to make them primarily be mothers and then joining the labor market when it will be feasible and men being the main sort of providers to the family. And this is whole structures around the 
a very traditional view of the family, a man and a woman, and then the kids. Single mothers, untypical families are not part of this plan, which is a mistake because the model of the family has changed a lot. So what you need is political will, but later on you need gender disaggregated data. We do have some, but still in Poland we miss a lot, and still we do not have many of this data available. But as I said, you need to hear what women need, and you have to hear women's voices. It means you need participation in political decision making of women and women's groups, women's NGOs, women's movement. This is not the case. And uh, tools are there. And I would not worry about tools how to actually do the gender budgeting because European Institute for Gender Equality, AGA, has produced a very beautiful toolkit, the same as the wonder of gender mainstreaming and for many others, you know, how to uh, eliminate the wage gap. They are all there, but they need to be used. And the problem is that uh, countries uh, actually, and uh, the level of the national uh, decision makers, they are not so ready to use it. If I'm talking about Poland, Polish uh, decision makers are very conservative, as I mentioned, and with this government, I doubt if it will change. Uh, of course, you need uh, to have specific actions and successes and so on. Uh, you need, for example, if we look at the very uh, two core areas when, when the new recovery plan for Europe is going forward, it means digital transformation and the green transformation, both sectors are very male dominated. It means energy sector and uh, sector, then you need some focus specifically addressing women, women's uh, education in IT, women's promotion uh, in this sector, and some of the targeted actions. This is, by the way, the recommendation of the um, House of Commons, the, the Parliamentary Committee on Gender Equality, uh, for the UK plans, that they do in, uh, incorporate all the specific actions. This is, in Poland, we are very far from that. So, you know, what we need, we need really to make it uh, more specific. And also we need more actions in a broader context, you know, how to relate work and family, how to include this unpaid work into the GDP calculations. This, this is not enough to do just the gender budgeting. This has to come together with other actions. In, uh, if I would um, think about, calling it briefly, we have to move from the very traditional model of economy into the partnership model, which is much more than just to have the gender budgeting. Uh, this is a quite um, lengthy process, and I was wondering to what extent the European Union can play a role. And of course, the European Union is doing a lot, having this very um, powerful legislation in place. But how to make it a transfer from the legislation and the proposals and what you propose to the national level is a problem because all the gender issues are soft issues and they are up to the national decision makers to, uh, to decide how they want to implement the directives. Uh, and frankly, um, um, you know, when I'm thinking about uh, what could be done, um, I'm really thinking more on the move, first of all, merging forces with the Greens and having a certain combination of the pressure from the, you know, bottom side. It means the Green movement in Poland and the, yes, and the women's movement in Poland could together fight for that. But at the same time, what you proposed is the pressure from the European Commission actually for countries to report on how they spend money. Uh, it's already many obligations in this respect. We have a special unit in the Ministry of Development who should follow, you know, gender mainstreaming and how the gender equality is represented in the spending. But so far, he, I must say, it's not very effective. So, um, let me just uh, maybe finish here. We could see if we can have some uh, solutions, more practical steps to be taken. But I would say first what we need in Poland is to make a, a gender impact assessment of the recovery plan, national recovery plan, 
which would be properly done by a group of experts, hopefully with the support of, uh, of the uh, European Union, but also what you do, uh, to, to link it and to have it. Because if not done by the government, I hope the best way will be to do it by the government, but if not, it could be done independently as a sort of a shadow report. And then we could have at least a ground on which we stand and we will know what's at stake. Uh, my view is uh, looking at the situation in Poland that we are moving backwards in gender equality because of what happened to the, to the restriction of the abortion law, to the ideas to withdraw from the Istanbul Convention, but also how the pandemic affected Polish women on the labor market. In Warsaw, every four women uh, lost their job and unpaid work increased. And I must say 45%, as far as I remember from the recent survey, said that they cannot work from home because they have kids to take care about and some elderly uh, parents. So this has to be solved, and I hope it could be solved together with other, you know, uh, countries, but also with the Green Movement. I think this alliance is very timely, and I really like to thank Eva for the invitation to this panel. So I will stop here, and I will be happy to, to just, uh, you know, uh, have discussion later on. Thank you, Eva, so much for this insight. Uh, and well, yeah, Alexandra and Eva uh, have mentioned that the political will is a condition to change on the gender budgeting matter. Uh, and here I have a question for Ola. You are the women's rights fighter, not only on the streets, but on the parliament, Polish parliament. Uh, can we talk about the political will on this subject, on this Polish parliament at all? Uh, and if this topic appears in the in 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 our parliament, if there's any gender budgeting elements in the Polish recovery fund, uh, and also uh, I would like to ask you uh, not only uh, in the um, uh, in the perspective of the ruling parties, but uh, the question. Uh, if there is uh, any um, mention concerning the gender budgeting, uh, for instance, in the opposition side. Uh, and finally, uh, will Polish women benefit from the recovery plan adopted in Poland? Um, thank you very much, uh, Magda, and good evening, everyone. Um, um, it's a very good question, and um, I think... Um, talking about gender budgeting in the current circumstances in Poland feels a little bit like a luxury, um, to be completely honest with you right now. Because I have a feeling we are, yes, we are talking about women's rights in parliament, but we're talking about absolute basics rather than making progress. Mm. We are um, in defense mode rather than um, progressing ahead. We are more and more often, um, since 2015 specifically, battling um, very uh, backwards um, looking legislative projects um, um, introduced in Parliament which are aimed to uh, ban abortion and either entirely or just about entirely. We are battling projects which men mean to reduce um, or um, um, axe um, um, sexual um, education and any gender education from schools um, and really are working very clearly against women and we are battling a, a very toxic narrative um, from the high governmental official, officials. For example, from the Minister of Education who keeps, um, who, who keeps uh, um, saying things publicly which sound like, um, I'm not exaggerating, like taken directly from some speeches by some um, um, authoritarian politicians, I don't want to even, you know, call their names from uh, 1933. Uh, and I even have made a, a direct side-by-side -side comparison of, of some of those quotes, just to make sure I'm not 
really, um, you know, uh, um, that, that's what is happening and this is what is happening. So, so I, I feel we really are very, um, very uh, strongly going backwards and really fighting for, 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 for the basic freedoms. And the best um, uh, example of that were um, huge mass pr protests that took place uh, during the pandemic, literally at the peak of the second wave of the pandemic, starting in um, October, um, when uh, a motion was put through to the uh, a constitutional tribunal um, to, to try and put um, a force through an ultimate, an, almost a, a ban on abortion, bypassing the parliament. And it actually succeeded. And um, hundreds and thousands of women, uh, you know, went on um, uh, the streets, um, despite of, of really um, of, of the peak of pandemic. And that is the best, I think, um, picture and an example of what is really happening. And um, and yes, um, I did look into the recovery and resilience plan, and you know, searched it through um, in the context of gender budgeting. Um, and yes, it's there to a certain extent. Um, there are um, our Polish recovery resilience plan is a 500 page document, almost a 500 page document. And I counted um, just to be precise, um, women uh, being mentioned there exactly 47 times and the gender budgeting or um, um, you know, talk about the principle of gender equality, in ensuring equal opportunities for all, it's there on two pages, page yeah. 90 and page 91, if you want to, you know, really um, go and, 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 have a, and have a read. Um, it does propose solutions like um, building teleworking opportunities, improving access to internet, developing digital competences, secure childcare, um, yes, it's there. Um, it talks, at the same time, the talk is very general. Um, in my opinion, we talk about um, that the recovery projects will comply with all accessibility standards, including principle of equal opportunities. We will prevent all forms of discrimination. Um, we will comply with the principle um, you know, of, um, of, of, of um, uh, rights, um, equal rights for all. But um, it, while it, it does look okay on paper, um, I feel it's very theoretical precisely because of what is happening in practice. Um, and it, I feel like this is there to satisfy the European Commission, um, mm -hmm. to get the European Commission to approve the funding, and then we'll, we'll see how it will look in practice. And um, um, in reality, um, we, we, the facts are um, quite, uh, as I said, and the statistics are quite, um, are not very favorable for women. Um, so our employment rate is lower um, than average, um, than the European average. The pay gap um, still exists, as my predecessor said. Um, we have uh, um, we have the legislative changes, which was the, the, the almost um, a full ban on abortion just now. Um, politicians openly criticize the East and want to actually revoke the Istanbul Convention, Insta, Insta, sorry, Istanbul Convention. And it is, it keeps coming back as a topic. Um, and also um, even the social program, which is a kind of a flagship social program introduced by the government, um, by the current government uh, back in 2016, that was meant to foster demographic growth. It actually, what it actually led to was, um, it didn't foster the demographic growth at all, but instead it lowered the employment rate amongst women by another two to three percentage points. It put us back. Um, and at the same time, it doesn't secure any pension um, support 
whilst women are taken out of the job market um, due to this um, due to this um, program. So um, for all those reasons, I have deep concerns that the two page um, uh, two page fragments um, from our recovery and resilience plans are there just to tick the box. And the reality is very much going in, 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 in the opposite direction. So I really, really would welcome any, you know, any attempts to track and measure this from the European Commission, from the European Parliament, um, and to, to, to help us um, kind of monitor um, how it's executed and how the funds are in invested and whether this is happening in a really just and equal way um i'd really hope for this but i think it, it does require actual tight measurements because the the two pages and the 47 mentions will not do it um alone so so that's that's my view on this um perhaps a bit pessimistic given the the the, the, the past years which were quite intense but that, I, th I think it's, it's, I'm hoping it's picturing the reality we're in. Thank you, Ola, so much for this insight on what is ha happening in Poland. Uh, I'm right now, I'm looking at the chat and the Q&A. We have no question. Eva, maybe you would like to uh, ask some additional questions for our panelists. Um, yes, I, I would like to uh, make one comment and ask uh, one question to Alexandra. Um, when uh, because people uh, they sometimes they don't see how we can address at the same time uh, green topics or green transition and uh, and uh, keep um, address uh, uh, equality gender equality and um, I wanted to give you two examples for the same result but going from two uh, methods. Uh, for example, um, I remember that there was a program of uh, uh, the Embassy of Switzerland in Poland. Uh, to, um, it was a program to, uh, for the thermomodernization of housing and uh, installation of uh, photovoltaics uh, for single mothers. Um, so, uh, at the same time... Uh, um, so um, at the same time they uh, they had a climate uh, result and at the same time they had um, uh, energy poverty they address energy poverty and uh, they address the uh, uh, gender inequalities so and uh, 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 when the Austrians I uh, just to, to recall that the uh, uh, Greens are in the government as the smaller uh, coalition, a uh, smaller partner in the coalition. They, um, uh, they decided to put 60% of the budget to the climate, but they made a big program addressing energy poverty. Uh, and uh, so it was not directly addressing women in the program because with the partner from uh, uh, center right it was not possible <laughs> but uh, they knew that addressing energy poverty uh, most of beneficent of this program will be women so uh, uh, and the single families uh, and uh, low income public and in this low income public and with uh, uh, bad housing, uh, people with uh, bad quality of housing, they knew that uh, women will be in majority in this population. So without uh, addressing it directly, they knew that they are addressing women. So, so you, can, um, you can find a, a method, <laughs> political way, <laughs> To, to do it, um, to do it uh, together. But I have another question to Alexandra, because I was really surprised when I read the first time the um, uh, European Green Deal, the communication of the European Commission on the European Green Deal in December 2019, that there was nothing, 
no one word about gender <laughs> and gender equality and so on. And I was so shocked. So my question is, uh, was it any debate on it in, in the European Parliament? Did you speak about that? Okay, I'll address the last question first, if I if I may. Um, very honestly, um, I haven't addressed it, but just because I've been so busy with Next Generation EU and then my main field of politics is digital policy. And this is really, I mean, this is happening every day right now and it's really urgent and we'll, we have to hand in all our amendments by the day after tomorrow. So we have to finish tomorrow, basically. I, I just simply haven't had the time, but it's, it's a very, very good point. And I discovered that the European, the Green Group here in the European Parliament did in 2012 a gender impact assessment on their proposal for the Green Deal, because let's remember that the Green Deal comes from the Green Party yeah, and not from Ursula von der Leyen, and the Commission picked it up. Um, and there was a gender impact assessment done with a lot of very valuable recommendations, which, which I intend to pick up as soon as I have time. And this brings us to your first question, which was extremely relevant because it's a question that's very often asked and it's, it's very important. And in the beginning, I thought it was sort of a dilemma as well until I started studying the issue. And then it gets really, really interesting because actually addressing gender equality, you also improve sustainability and combating climate change and everything. It goes hand in hand, really. You mentioned one, one interesting example and you said the Austrians have it in the national plan as well on, on energy, poverty and housing for single mothers and so on. Um, what I really like are the projects that see women more in the driver's seat, you know, not at the receiving end, but really taking the decisions. Mm -hmm. um, we know, for example, that uh, women make as consumers and they often make the, the choices in households and family what is being bought and they make more sustainable choices. There's a lot of research on this fact that, that women choose the sustainable product, that for them it's a criteria for choosing a product and so on. So that uh, women as consumers are very important. Um, Women as people, if they t take decisions, and I think Eva mentioned that before, it's also gender budgeting. It's not also about distributing the money, but it's also about organizing a more democratic form of, of popular participation. So asking women's group, asking the women's movement, asking also other groups of the population and not always the usual people who decide on women politics. For example, on mobility, for example, urban mobility, you know, if you ask men what they intend by mobility, they will say, we need streets for our cars and we need parking lots. Yeah, exactly. And if you ask women, they will say, we need public transport and we need to be able to walk safely because we walk with our children, we walk with the buggy, we walk with our elderly uh, parents or relatives um, who have trouble walking and who need a lot of space and so on, who need to be safe. And they don't call for roads, they call for public transport, for cycling um, paths and, and for walkways. So you make a lot more sustainable choices in cities where you listen to, to women. And Vienna is a great example for that. And when at the, in Vienna, they have some forms of gender budgeting that are quite advanced. And one thing that has really changed is the mobility in Vienna. Um, so women make the world more sustainable if they're asked. There's even proof that women make more sustainable choices when they lead companies women, uh, companies that are female-led with female CEOs or female majority in the board have uh, reduced the CO2 emissions more quickly than male-dominated companies. And I thought that was crazy when I heard this for the first time, but this was, I was told this by the European Investment Bank, they did the research. And this is something that when they invest in the rest of the world, what, what they call, you know, economic cooperation with the rest of the world development aid, this is considered obvious. The women are always involved in the decision making. It's just when it comes to Europe, they think, oh, it's already done and we don't need it. And mm. that shows how important the political will is, because if you have women making the choices, um, the choices will be more sustainable and we will reduce our emissions more quickly. We will live in a more sustainable way. So it's really, there's no dilemma between choosing sustainability and greening and choosing gender equality. If you choose gender equality, automatically you choose greening as well. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, good answer. Yes, this is a, uh, an excellent answer, and uh, we observe it at COP, uh, uh, every COP, so uh, this climate uh, summits. And uh, when there was this um, action plan, uh, climate action plan for, for gender, uh, one of uh, big uh, topics was the decision making and um, inside the negotiations. Uh, because the delegations, uh, we know that the consequences of climate change uh, are uh, more uh, more um, painful for women. Women are the first victims of climate change and climate disasters uh, and so on, and uh, migration, climate migrations and so on. And uh, but at the COP, the delegation, national delegations are. Uh, dominated by men, so they go, they come from 7 to 40 percent of women, the delegation with 7 uh, percent of uh, female members in the delegation, so they were trying to make it more equal. And after when we study different bodies that make decisions, uh, it's never uh, uh, equality between men and women, and when there are bodies that decide on finance, there are practically no women at all. So, so, and so this is this, this decision making concerning money and how funds are spent. This is really a huge priority and this is what we must fight for as uh, women if we want to have uh, uh, equality when and women and more sustainable world and uh, achieving climate goals. So, I believe that we came uh, to the end and uh, I will just give you uh, one minute to each of you for the word of conclusion, starting maybe to by Ursula Zieliska, as she was the last one. <laughs> Please, Ola. Um, thank you. So, uh, uh, I, I, I have to conclude uh, more optimistically because I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if I, if I couldn't find hope. So, so absolutely the green policies, honestly, are for me, um, that's a way to combine the two. Um, just as, 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 as some of you uh, just mentioned just now, um, it's uh, in doing two in one, um, if we can improve equality, that's great. And that's exactly what we're all about. So I just absolutely believe in this, um, you know, stronger European uh, bonds, uh, um, the green um, groups working across the countries, learning from one another, and then working with the European Commission um, and with the European Parliament to help strengthen the central um, measuring and monitoring. That's if, if if that all works together, then 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 we will improve it. Um, uh, even in troublemaker countries like Poland, Hungary, and uh, you know um, um, others. So, so that's that's what I'm working towards, and that's my hope. That's where I'm pinning my hopes on. And and thank you for for giving me ideas and and, and some energy from from where you are and uh, where you're working on it. So it's really great to know and and, and get that energy um, from you. Thank you very much. So oh, Eva, what is your conclusion? I would like to, to, to add that you are in the board of the Congress of Women, that is rather exceptional organization of women, and uh, they, not only in Poland, but there is Polish Congress on Women in Brussels, in Berlin, in uh, Prague, in Vienna, in Paris. So uh, Polish women organize themselves to, to debate, to find solutions, to organize themselves. It's wonderful. So the word of conclusion, uh, Eva. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much again for listening, for an opportunity to listen to all these interesting uh, presentations. I'm really um, very hopeful what Alexandra has presented. You know, I believe it's a next step and it's a solid step. And I would like uh, to maybe see the opportunities to use it also at to, to be used by national level. So I'm waiting in what way this, what you do in the European Parliament could be more linked of what we do in Poland, specifically by in that national level and how we can link, uh, not necessarily going only through the government, but also using the women's movement, which is very strong and green movement 
I think coming together uh, for the purpose, because I think it's an opportunity. The pandemic and the recovery plan and this uh, reconciliation is, uh, is an opportunity to move ahead and to say, hey, women are the force and we cannot forget the demographic context. Women are needed on the labor market. They also produce new labor if they give birth, etc. We have the force. So how to use it and how to change the system, which is now unfortunately still very oppressive for women, gender equality. So Alexandra, you have the last word. <laughs> Thank you so much. I don't need to say much because you're so great. You've already said everything. Um, I would just like to add that this is, I think I share the view that we have a unique opportunity here with this process starting at the, at the level of the European Union, the monitoring of the recovery and resilience facility, the awareness that has been raised um, around the ideas of economic equality, and especially this gender budgeting process starting in the European budget, because this will have a great impact in the long term. It will take a few years, but it will have a great impact on member states and especially on member states as Poland, who have a, a huge share of those funds and you really need this, so your government really needs those funds. So I think that's that's extremely important and let's, let's cooperate on this, very, really looking forward to this. Um, I think it's important when there's a strong pushback, as especially in Poland and a few other countries, to go forward even stronger, you know, not to stay on the defensive, but to try to fight for something else. And if you achieve some kind of economic equality, it's a lot easier to fight for rights as well because women who have their own income are a lot less dependent also from the views of men because I mean, they're independent. They don't need to, to depend on men and they express their views also free, more, more freely. And well, the last point I think was that you made that gender equality in greening go together. And this is why I think fighting for gender equality is so important for the green parties as well, because it all goes in the, in the same direction. And it's, it's not the same fight, but they're two fights that are closely related. And I'm happy to be part of a party that really well, fights for both these issues. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. Thanks, Magdalena. Thanks to all our partners. And we will continue this discussion at our Green Summer University for the first time. We will have with us uh, a Green Congress of Women. So together with the Congress of Women, we will be all together. And uh, we will continue uh, also on this topic of uh, finance and the gender budgeting. Thanks a lot and uh, good luck to all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one. Have a good evening. Bye-bye.